The glory of God hath enlightened it, and the Lamb is the lamp thereof. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Dear Reverend Father Rector, dear Reverend Fathers, dear seminarians, brothers, dear sisters, dear faithful, those words come from the Apocalypse, and they sum up both our ideal of the priesthood and our hopes in heaven. The glory of God hath enlightened it, and the Lamb is the lamp thereof. The Lamb is the lamp thereof. We must look to our Lord Jesus Christ from start to finish. He is the model. He is the example. He is the priest. A short time ago, about a, about a month ago, I was testing a couple of the boys in Australia, Filipino boys, for their first communion. It's one of the most rewarding efforts that a priest makes. Some of the most rewarding moments that a priest has as he prepares these young hearts to receive our Lord. And there was one little boy in particular, he was full of questions. At one point he said, Father, how is it that there are millions of people, but only one God? Where does the Pope live, Father? Are you his friend? And that's when I said, I get to ask the questions. I'm the one quizzing you. He passed his quiz, and he was preparing for his first confession. And he approached me one day on the playground, about eight years old, this boy. He approached me on the playground and he said, Father, why is it that you sit in Jesus' seat and you put your name on the confessional door? Well, if you know your theology, you know what to answer. The priests of the Old Testament were a figure of Christ. But as St. Thomas Aquinas says, the priests of the new law work in His person. For what I have pardoned, St. Paul says, for what I have pardoned, I have par if I have pardoned anything, for your sakes have I done it in the person of Christ. If a little boy ever asks you that question, why do you put your name on the confessional door, Father Rosario? You can answer, it's because the priests of the New Testament participate physically in ordine agendi, in the grace of the hypostatic union. You know this, but you have to know it so well that you can bring it down to the level of the simplest child. Can we truly say that the priest is another Christ, that he works, he acts in persona Christi? We certainly can. He does physically participate in ordine agendi, in the order of action, in the grace of the hypostatic union. Let us today then explore a little more deeply than we could explain to an eight-year-old or even than we could explain to a 12-year-old who 18 years ago was among the servers of my first Masses in Edmonds, Washington. What a joy to see him now at the altar offering the sacrifice of the Mass himself in the person of Christ and at the very same physical altar that so many of us, where our priesthood began. Let us look at this question then a little more deeply. What do we mean when we say that the priest is another Christ? When we say that a priest is another Christ, we mean that he, like Christ, has been anointed. His whole human nature has been consecrated 
to the cause of redemption, the cause of sanctification, the cause of salvation, and ever for the glory of the Father. Is there any wonder then that a priest is celibate when he is entirely consecrated to such a work? The priest is another Christ in that the concerns of the Father are His business. He is another Christ in that Mary is His mother. The mother and the cathedral of His vocation and of His ordination. He is another Christ in that in Him are united powers, both human and divine. He reads hearts in the secrecy of the confessional. He cures the sick. Venial sin. He raises the dead. Mortal sin. He raises souls from the state of mortal sin. Ego te absolvo. He calms storms of conscience. Fox. Go in peace. He changes bread into the body, and wine into the blood of the Savior. By saying, this is my body, and this is my blood. In saying these words, the priest does more good for the world than anyone else upon earth. The priest is another Christ, and that he preaches the same Gospel, forgives the same types of sins, is welcomed and rejected by the same types of people as Christ was. He who rejects you rejects me. Be good then and gentle to your people, lest they reject Christ on your account. He who rejects you rejects me. In the confessional, Apply the logic of the cross. It's not about how hot it is. Try the mission confessional sometime. I wish for you an hour of confessions in Fiji, in the village. Bring your own fan. And a mask if you can, because it's filled with mold. It's not about the heat of the confessional. It's not about the number of hours. It must not be about the, at times, even disturbing qualities of a penitent. Let's say the quirks or the difficulties or the struggles to make, themselves, make oneself clear. It's not about any of that. You must apply the logic of the cross. They come to you in the confessional because you are Christ upon the cross. And your words must be as those of Christ from the cross. He doesn't say many words. But every word He says is filled with meaning. He speaks of charity and the willingness to be crucified for sinners' sake. It's you who give hope. Christ through you who gives hope to the penitent. Every penitent should walk away from your confessional with the joy of the good thief and with the hope of the good thief. This day, you will be with me in paradise. Yes, you can rise from your sins. Be good. Be Christ to your people. The priest loves souls with a share in the very love of Christ. And it's thanks to Christ whose virtues he shares. If he is learned, if the priest is learned or prayerful, if he's meek or courageous, it's thanks to Christ whose virtues he shares. He is a shepherd. He guides He's a physician. He heals. He's a father. He leads. He's a mediator. 
He prays. And what a power the prayer of the priest contains. All through your priesthood, the good people will come to you and say, Father, please pray for me. Please pray for my family. And they mean it. Because your prayers mean something. Like Aaron in the Old Testament, who ran out to the very flames of fire that were consuming the wicked people of Israel. And only the priest, not even Moses himself, could stop the flames. Only the priest could prevent disaster. And he ran right to the very flames of the fire. He stood between the living and the dead. And the flames ceased. It means that he was the next to be consumed if the flames did not stop. And God stopped. And we're told that Aaron in the Old Testament, as he ran towards those flames and he wore his priestly vestments, that in those vestments he carried the whole world, the whole nation upon his back. And that's the priest. There will be times at the confidior where you feel it. When you say it's through my fault, through my fault, you mean it. Not just your faults personally committed. But you're confessing on behalf of all of your people. If they are not what they should be, it's in part because we are not what we should be. The power contained in the prayer of another Christ. Sometimes we must just kneel before the altar and say, Lord, You prompt me to love this soul so much. You must love Him too. Or You would not give me this love. Do what I cannot do for them, would You? Touch them in ways that I cannot within the very depths of the soul. Yes, the priest is another Christ. He is victim with Christ. He is priest. He is victim with Christ. And he offers the sacrifice and must die in the process. There's nothing quite like a priest on all the earth. He has powers that excel those of the angels in heaven. As Father Schaefer puts it, five words. Five words and the flesh that quivered on the cross 19 centuries ago rests in His fingers. We raise it on high for the faithful to see and adore. So sublime an authority does the priest have. And yet so great an obedience is required of him a Christ-like obedience, even unto death. Archbishop Lefebvre in 1938 wrote, we must never forget this. If we obey, we are in full truth. If we resist, we are in error. Man is never so great as when he kneels. He is never so true as when he obeys. There are numberless reasons why a priest should be Christ-like. And yet there are a hundred reasons why we find it hard. The temptations are so many. Satan pursues the priest everywhere, even into the sanctuary. Therefore, in order to be a priest, in order to be the priest that Christ wants you to be, Father Rosario, you must fight the battle, not just today, but all life long. You must fight the battle that Christ the Master expects you to wage for souls and for His sake. He will never abandon you. That's a fact. But never take your priesthood for granted. Christ is always there. 
He's always there to support us. The temptation has always been the same. It always comes down to pride. I was gratified to see your hands shaking as you said the Veni Creator yesterday at your first Mass. And so they should in a certain way in the soul all life long as you offer Mass. It's Christ who is our strength. The moment we get comfortable and we think that I'm a priest forever, the hard yards are done, I've made it through the seminary, that's just the start. It's just the training. And the real battles are fought later. That same little boy who asked me if I was friends with the Pope, after he made his first communion within the week, I said, all right, now you can start training for serving. Now you can come to the altar. Let's practice. So he went in with a group of the boys and he practiced for Mass. And when we went back outside, he came up to me again and he said, Father, I was, I was very nervous. I said, oh, were you? Why is that? And he nodded towards the chapel and he said, he's God. And I don't know anything. And that's the way we should feel all our lives. He's God. And I don't know anything. I'm no one. I'm nothing. I'm nothing but nervous and open to God's help. Be as Christ and never take any significant step without including your mother. Today, as you offer your another, well, let's say your first Sunday Mass. Today as you offer your first Sunday Mass, you hear Christ say words like these, Dominic, you have come at my call. Now follow me. Follow me in poverty. Follow me in humility. Both freely chosen by charity. The nativity is not a suggestion. The nativity has a tone of an urgent plea. Do as I've done. Live as I live or you will not make it. There's only one way through the battlefield. And that is the poverty and the humility of Christ chosen with the charity of Christ. For the faithful, I think, they often consider that poverty is easy for the priest. It's not easy for the priest. Poverty does not come naturally for the priest. Nor, in fact, does humility. The faithful are always bowing to you, often even literally. not liturgical, but they often do. And they give you their very best. Every home you go to, they give you the best they have. The richest they have. If you go to Fiji, you'll have the only chair in the house. And everyone else will be sitting at your feet on the mat as you eat. Because they will not eat in front of the priest. They let him eat. You learn to eat quickly so that you don't have to wait up all night. Poverty does not come easy for the priest. He has to look for it. If you want to be poor with Christ poor, you must choose poverty and simplicity in your private life. On the days when you are free to choose for yourself what you have, where you go, what you do, which is usually your holiday. It's there that you have to make choices of poverty. As Christ did during His public life. 
there were private moments. And in those private moments, he chose to have no roof over his head. And he multiplied loaves and fishes, not porterhouse and cap caviar. And even so, that was for others, not for himself. When he was at the home of Lazarus, he was waited on hand and foot. So, when he was free to choose, we find that he led a life of greatest simplicity. Unadorned. Be content then to be as Christ. Poor. Humbled. Be content to have no strength but Him. Each of us priests, we need Him. And we need our mother. And we're good in good company in that. For even the saints in heaven need Christ. For according to St. Thomas Aquinas, they will need consummation through Christ Himself on whom their glory depends as it is written in the Apocalypse. The glory of God hath enlightened it. That is, the city of the saints. The glory of God hath enlightened it. And the Lamb is the lamp thereof. Make then your prayer today the prayer of the communion antiphon. One thing, one thing I have asked of the Lord, this I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. May the glory of God enlighten your priesthood, and may the lamp, may the Lamb be the lamp thereof. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.